DS4 is a premium compact hatch that delights in being a little different, with sporty five-door coupe styling and plenty of signs of Gallic flair, whether you go for the standard version or the slightly more capable crossback model. If you want something more individual than the usual Astra, Golf or Focus Fair, and a more interesting option than premium German compact models can provide, then assuming you don't mind making a few minor compromises, it could well be worth a look. The DS brand, we're told, is all about more distinctive style and technology. So what might its interpretation of a premium badged focus size family hatchback be? Well, the answer is revealed here with the much improved DS4 model. Well, we used to know this car as a Citroen. It was introduced in 2011 by the double Chevron brand, but shortly after the formation of the newly formed DS mark in 2015, this model was relaunched merely by the DS4 with a smarter look and a much clearer idea of its target market. Now, that was important, for in its Citroen days, this design's rather bizarre combination of family hatchback, coupe and SUV left it with something of an identity crisis. Fortunately, the DS people seem to understand it a little better, uh, clarifying the appeal of this model line by creating the two distinct variants that we're looking at here. This crossback version uh, keeps the original car's highish ride height and adds in a few carefully chosen SUV styling cues to try and attract buyers from the Qashqai crossover set. Relieved of the need to appeal to such folk, this standard DS4 model is now freer to assume the role of a premium sporty hatch and target people who might otherwise buy, say, a BMW 1 Series or an Audi A3 or, well, at the very least, an Alfa Romeo Giulietta or an upmarket Seat Leon. Whichever DS4 variant appeals, you'll find it a little more sophisticated than before, especially inside, where a redesigned 7-inch infotainment touchscreen now includes the latest Apple CarPlay and MirrorLink media connectivity. Spec this model right and you can get things that will really set it apart from rivals. Features such as limousine-like quilted leather, unique two-tone paint finishes and technology clever enough to track the car if it's stolen, notify you of upcoming service appointments and even email you if your DS4 is lent out and then driven further than it should be. Signs then of the innovation that really should characterise the DS brand. But... Is it all enough to convince target buyers to try something new? Let's find out. So, what is it like? Well, you might wonder. After all, the engines and the underpinnings of this model are borrowed from a car never intended to prioritise driving enjoyment, Citroen C4. Yet that's exactly what the DS people reckon is going to be served up here. A claim endorsed by the focused, sporty cockpit with its supportive wraparound seats. First impressions depend a little on the variant you've chosen. This crossback version sits 30mm higher than its standard counterpart, uh, giving you more of an elevated view that can be embellished by a touch we really like. This standard panoramic windscreen with individual sliding sun blinds that, when pushed back, give you a 45-degree field of vision. That's brilliant when, uh, say, you're parked right underneath a traffic light waiting for it to change. Right from the beginning, then, you've got the idea. Things are going to be a little different from the norm. And one of our issues with the original version of this car was that its damping was a little over firm, and it still is with the standard DS4 model. This crossback version, though, certainly benefits from its added suspension travel, although it still makes you very aware of the imperfections of our country's terrible tarmac. Somehow, though, this seems easier to forgive now that the Citroen branding has been removed from this car. It's supposed to be sporty, and to be frank, the ride really isn't any worse than you'd find on the kind of cars that potential buyers will be cross-shopping this one against, uh, models like Alfa Romeo's Giulietta or maybe a Seat Leon FR. It's all a world away from a Citroen C4, a further differentiating point lying with the substitution of that model's electric steering system for a supposedly more fearsome electro-hydraulic package here. The setup's a touch heavy at low speeds, but, as promised, gives you good feedback if you're minded to throw this car around. And you just might be. 
True, this car would benefit from the more modern EMP2 platform if it's a Peugeot 308 cousin, but even with the older, less rigid PF2 chassis that soldiers on here, body roll is well controlled and the car feels taut and quite responsive. Complementing that is a terrific six-speed manual gearbox that allows you to snap up and down the ratios as if you were Sebastian Loeb in a round of the World Rally Championship. <laughs> it just all goes to show how basically the same mechanical package can be tailored radically differently to suit different products. And under the bonnet, well, the most popular DS4 engine choice will undoubtedly be the one we're trying here, the 120 brake horsepower, 1.6 litre blue HDI diesel unit. It's a decently refined power plant and thanks to 300 newton metres of torque, it's also acceptably rapid, more so in fact than the 11.2 rest to 62 miles per hour time might suggest. Top speed's 120 miles an hour and there's the option of an E86 auto gearbox that performs its self-shifting duties considerably more smoothly than the old Citroen model's jerky EGS unit. Don't automatically tick the box for this diesel though without considering the more affordable petrol alternative, a clever three-cylinder 1.2-litre PureTech engine. With 130 brake horsepower on tap, this makes 62 miles an hour in 9.9 .9 seconds en route to 123 miles an hour to the accompaniment of an agreeably urgent thrum. At the top of the range, there's an automatic only blue HDI diesel with 180 brake horsepower and 400 newton meters of torque, enough to reach 62 miles an hour in 8.6 seconds en route to 127 miles an hour. We should also mention the other engines on offer. There's a mid-range diesel option, the Blue HDI 150 variant, which virtually replicates the performance figures of its Pokia 180 stablemate, and two THP petrol models using the older BMW-developed 1.6-litre turbo engine, now tweaked to meet Euro 6 emissions. With these, you choose either the 165 brake horsepower version with automatic transmission, or a top 210 brake horsepower manual high-performance derivative which has had its exhaust tuned to better get the blood pumping through enthusiastic veins as it sprints to 62 miles an hour in 8.5 seconds on the way to 146 miles per hour. This variant gets from a standing start to 1,000 metres in well under 30 seconds. There's no option of four-wheel drive to give this crossback version the off-road capability partly promised by its looks, but like all DS4s, this variant does get an intelligent traction control system that optimizes anti-skid control on surfaces with little grip. This also improves startup performance, particularly on muddy or snow-covered surfaces. You'll certainly be glad of it in the next cold winter snap. We've had four-door coupes. When this DS4 was originally launched in 2011, its uh, designers decided it was about time we had a five-door one. The stylists of rival models like Seat's Leon and particularly Alfa Romeo's Giulietta will claim that this her concept is nothing new, but cars like those aren't quite as extreme as this one. The swept-back roofline is more distinctly sporty, yet at the same time your eyes are drawn to the other influences here. The sculpted wheel arches characteristic of a crossover or a small SUV. And the premium hatch feel of the chrome-finished waistline and the dark-tinted windows. It was an interesting confection in its original form that's been made more appealing in the translation of this design to its new role in the heart of the freshly formed DS brand model lineup. Now, as we've explained elsewhere in this film, there are now two distinct kinds of DS4. This crossback model that retains the higher suspension settings of the original one and adds SUV styling cues that it's hoped to appeal to those shopping in the Qashqai class. And this standard version that now sits lower but retains the firm damping that the DS people hope will give it the sporty feel that buyers like in premium brand small hatches like BMW's 1 Series and Mercedes A-Class. As for the visual differences between the two variants, well, if you haven't picked up the fact that this crossback version sits 30 millimetres higher than its standard model counterpart, you'll otherwise find the other alterations relatively difficult to spot. Brownie points for you if you clock this crossback version's silver roof rails and its gloss black finishing for the wheels, for the front fog lamps and the front bumper trim. 
Both DS4 models adopt brand-specific styling at the front, where the vertical grille now proudly incorporates the DS Wings brand logo and extends smoothly into headlights that feature LED vision xenon technology on plusher variants like this one. Designed to resemble jewels, these lamps incorporate scrolling indicators and deliver a unique lighting signature that the brand plans to extend right across its future model range. There are also LED daytime running lights and top variants like this one have these LED front fog lamps too that turn with the bends. As a result, in all, there can be no fewer than 84 LEDs at the front of this car. In profile, the whole uh, five-door coupe thing makes more sense with a swept back rear roof section that encases the back door handles in these extended frames. It's all certainly very different from the conservatively boxy Citroen C4 hatchback upon which this design is based. A car which is 60mm shorter and 40mm taller and manufactured in the same French Mulhouse factory. So, the same people screwed the two products together, but apparently with a little bit more love in the DS4's case to reflect the extra care and precision that the DS brand is supposed to require. We're not quite sure what that says about the way a C4 is built, but there's no doubt that this car has the uh, feel of a premium product with lovely design touches like the kink at the bottom of the doors that draw the eye toward the muscular rear haunches. At the rear, the roof-mounted spoiler will be finished in bespoke paintwork if you opted for one of the contrast packs that colour not only this item but also the roof itself in either black, purple, orange or, if you're especially extrovert, vibrant blue. These shades contrasting with a standard metallic or, as in this case, pearlescent chosen paint finish. There's certainly a lot going on here. These stylized bumper cutouts at each corner, for example, and this chrome-finished lower diffuser with its twin tailpipes. The finishing touches are nice too, the neat beasting roof aerial and the matte black rear wiper. And on this crossback model, the lettering that runs between these smeared back tail lights. Time to take a seat up front, where perhaps the most distinctive feature is this panoramic windscreen. Now push back these roof panels and you're given an almost unique 45 degree view upwards. If you don't like this arrangement, or if the day is especially hot and you don't want to fry your forehead, then simply pull the visors back down. Now, the only slight downside with this arrangement lies with the fact that because of the rearward travel that these panels need, it's not possible to fit either a sunroof or the kind of panoramic glass top that's now in vogue in this segment. We like them retracted fully upwards, though, creating, as this does, a really airy feel up front here, accentuated by the slightly raised driving position. Once comfortable in front of the curvy fascia, ensconced in these figure-hugging seats, you grip a smart, chrome-trimmed, leather-stitched, four-spoke, multifunction steering wheel. And through it, you view a three-instrument binnacle that uh, fuses analog and digital displays and a layout that looks nice, although it isn't always instantly easy to read. Sticking with the individualistic theme, you can change both the background colour of the instruments and the style of the readouts to suit your personal preference. The central speedo dial doubles as an information centre, offering speed, trip computer, audio and compass settings. Anything this can't tell you will probably be covered on the central fascia infotainment screen, this feature redesigned to suit this model's more exalted DS brand status. It's a 7-inch touch-sensitive display with standard navigation, plus the usual audio, Bluetooth phone and trip computer options. As with the instruments, you can personalise the display colour scheme too. There's a choice, Rubis or Sapphire. And there's also two features we haven't seen before on this type of display, a calculator and a calendar. More importantly, you also get plenty of media connectivity, this being one of the first cars in the segment to offer buyers the Apple CarPlay and MirrorLink systems. These allow you to duplicate the functionality of your smartphone onto this screen. Plus, there's the option of internet browsing and Wi-Fi, so it's really very clever. Perhaps inevitably with any design that tries to be distinctive, there are a few issues. Taller drivers might take issue with the wheel's rather limited adjustment range and with the rather upright pedal placement. 
The small rear screen means that it's not easy to judge where the rear of the car is, hence the standard rear parking sensors. And though the upper dashboard covering has a quality feel, scratchier plastics are used further down. It's also a bit disappointing that you only get a single cup holder if that's not being used by the removable ashtray. And the glove box is tiny, most of its space being taken up by the fuse box. Other storage cubbies include a small cupboard box here between the seats, a drawer under the front passenger seat, an open stowage area in front of the gear stick, which has 12 volt USB and aux in points, and appropriately enough for a French car, door bins that are generous enough to accommodate a bottle of wine. What you'll remember though are the lovely touches. We pay extra for the lovely quilted watch strap leather finish that gives the cabin a classier feel than almost anything in the segment. And even if you can't stretch to that, pleasingly distinctive features include these Art Deco finished door pulls, a set of chrome trimmed vents, and if you've specified any kind of leather trim, a massaging feature for the seats that you'll really appreciate on longer journeys. Time to move rearwards and check out the accommodation provided for backseat folk. Now this is, to be frank, the thing that has so far caused most controversy with this car. And you begin to understand why from the moment you move towards these rather narrow doors whose shape is necessarily compromised by the swept back coupe roof line. To open them, you have to locate handles concealed in window frames whose trailing edge is acutely sharp. So much so that unless you're very careful, you'll find it routinely connecting either with yourself or with adjacent solid objects. In other words, getting in isn't as easy as it will be in a conventional focus size family hatch. But then this isn't a conventional focus size family hatch. And if you've forgotten that, then you'll certainly be reminded of the whole five door coupe concept that the design of this car is based around once you take a seat inside. There's a dark, rather restricted feel, not helped by limited legroom and the narrow tinted side windows, while the paired back roof line will leave headroom at a premium for taller folk. Plus, there's quite a high central transmission tunnel that'll make the carriage of three adults really rather difficult. Better, we think, to consider this car as the Coupe DS is determined it ought to be, making comparisons with something like a Volkswagen Scirocco more valid than those with, say, a Volkswagen Golf. Viewed in that light, yeah, it's all pretty practical back here and quite OK for two adults or three children, as long as the journey isn't too long. Indeed, if you're in that frame of mind, you might even be quite happy to forgive the fact that these rear windows don't open. With the darkened glass, that can, as I've suggested, make things feel a little claustrophobic. The fixed window frames are there because these sweeping rear haunches ensure that there's absolutely nowhere downwards for the glass to go. Still, at least that saves three kilograms per door. Well, it's best to look on the bright side, isn't it? And out back, well, the boot has a high lip and a relatively narrow opening. Get your stuff inside and you'll find that it's 23 litres smaller than this model's Citroen C4 Stablemate, but at 385 litres, it's still slightly larger than the trunk provided in Alfa Romeo's Giulietta, or even um, in the Volkswagen Golf. Plus, there's much more space than you get in a Ford Focus or a proper coupe like that Scirocco model I just mentioned. There's no more room beneath the floor, but provided you avoid entry-level trim, you do get a ski hatch for longer items. There are also the usual bag hooks and a 12 volt socket and tie down points, plus a really nice touch. This removable torch that automatically recharges itself. You might need it too on a darkened roadside if you opt not to take up the option of a temporary space saver spare wheel. And bear in mind that if you go for that optional Denon Hi-Fi system, the boot-mounted subwoofer will reduce the luggage capacity I've just quoted down to 359 litres. If you need more space, then pushing forward the split-folding rear bench will free up a reasonable 1,021 litres. Pricing for the standard DS4 model sits mainly in the 20 to 25,000 pound bracket. Now with most of the affordable engines, buyers have the option of finding an extra premium of around 1,200 pounds to go from entry-level elegance trim to the plusher prestige spec that we're trying here. 
Now, if you like the thought of a sporty premium hatchback like that, but also find yourself attracted by the latest breed of Qashqai-like crossovers, then in DS4 crossback form, this model line aims to offer the best of both worlds. Crossback variants uh, with their raised ride height and SUV styling cues are based around selected derivatives offered with the prestige trim level and command a price premium of £1,000 over their standard DS4 model counterparts. Want a few more DS4 specifics? Well, let's see. And most buyers will be choosing between the two mainstream engines, a PureTech 130 three-cylinder turbo petrol unit and a Blue HDI 120 1.6 litre diesel. Choose to find the £1,750 premium necessary to get that diesel, and you'll also get the option of the brand's latest E86 automated transmission, offered for an extra £1,200 over the cost of the manual model. Go beyond the two volume engines I've just mentioned, and there is quite a step up in price. Think in terms of needing a budget of around £23,000 if you want the extra performance of either the THP 1.6 litre petrol power plant or the Blue HDI 150 diesel. At the top of the range, the Blue HDI 180 model comes only with E86 auto transmission and costs just over £25,000. Enough with the DS detail. Time to check out this car's value proposition against rivals. And we'll start with the standard DS4 model, which is the kind of thing that you might buy if you wanted a Focus or an Astra sized family hatch, but you'd like something a bit more, well, stylish and premium. Now, the prestige German brands predictably dominate this market with established contenders like the BMW 1 Series, the Audi A3, and the Mercedes A Class. These are cars that typically would cost you £1,500 to £2,000 more than an equivalent DS4, although their difference would doubtless be greater than that if you were to match to this French model's more generous equipment levels. We think it more likely, though, that this DS4 will appeal to buyers who might typically be looking at posh hatches that, like this one, aspire to be a 1 Series, an A3 or an A-Class. Cars like Volvo Z40 or the Lexus CT200H. The DS people seem to agree, for they price the various derivatives of this car almost exactly against equivalent versions of the V40, while the CT200H hybrid is priced almost identically against a comparable DS4 Blue HDI 120 diesel. In terms of other potential premium options of the class, a uh, Mini Clubman would cost around the same, but an Alfa Romeo Giulietta could potentially save you £1,000 or so. All these cars offer buyers the tempting proposition of a little more style and individuality than you get from a conventional Focus or Golf and for very little more money. But of course, that is not the whole picture. There are plenty of family hatches that significantly undercut Golf or Focus prices. Cars like uh, Vauxhall's Astra, Renault's Megane or Kia's Seed, for example. And potential DS4 customers need to be happy in finding the necessary three to £4,000 premium necessary to graduate up from one of these. The DS people, quite rightly, would argue that this car's much cheaper cousins, the Citroen C4 and the Peugeot 308, more accurately target those kind of models, though. On to the value proposition of this DS4 Crossback. Uh, for us, the closest car in concept to this, another premium hatch with SUV styling cues, is Volvo's V40 Cross Country model. Now that car costs between £1,000 and £2,000 more than this one, depending on the derivative you're looking at. So from the DS brand's point of view, that is a very good start. Bear in mind, though, that a number of purpose-designed family crossover models, uh, cars like Nissan's Qashqai and Kia's Sportage, will cost you slightly less. DS marketeers counter by reminding us of their objective that this DS4 Crossback should have the class and quality of similarly sized and powered premium brand crossovers, costing considerably more. Cars like Mercedes GLA and Audi's Q3. Ultimately, we'd suggest that you try this car for yourself and see which perspective you agree with. If, having considered all of that, you conclude that it is this DS4 that you really want, then your decision could be clinched by a generous showing by this car on a standard spec sheet. And is that what's been delivered here? Well, let's find out. Even with entry-level elegance trim, all models get alloy wheels of 17 inches in size, plus LED daytime running lights, front fog lamps that turn with the bends, power folding mirrors, a perimetric and volumetric alarm, auto headlamps and wipers, 
dark tinted rear windows and rear parking sensors. Unfortunately though, you have to pay extra for a temporary spare wheel if you want to avoid being stuck with a puncture repair kit. Inside you'll find automatic dual zone air conditioning, a leather trimmed multifunction steering wheel, cruise control with a speed limiter, an auto dimming rear view mirror and a really unique feature in this class, a panoramic windscreen with individual sliding sun blinds that widen your field of vision. We like the little touches too, like the rechargeable torch in the boot and the way the remote central locking also closes the windows for you. Infotainment is handled by a standard 7-inch touchscreen via which you access a six-speaker DAB audio system and eMyWay satellite navigation. Media connectivity includes the Mirrorlink and Apple CarPlay systems that allow you to duplicate the operation of your phone onto the center dash touchscreen. And there's Bluetooth hands-free and media streaming, plus USB and aux in sockets. Our favourite standard feature, though, is the DS Connect box, which really is very clever. It includes the kind of SOS and assistance functionality that we're now reasonably familiar with, which is there to automatically summon the emergency services if the airbags go off. Some of the other Connect box features, though, uh, may be new to you. An included monitoring pack, for example, that gives you a virtual instrument manual and can advise you of forthcoming service appointments and will give you eco-driving tips. Then there's the mapping pack that can be set to email you if your DS4 leaves a given geographical area. Useful if, say, you lend your car to your son or daughter. Also included is a tracking function that will give the police your vehicle's location if it's stolen. Stretch up to the plusher prestige trim level we're trying here and your car will look more distinctive courtesy of piercing LED vision headlamps with directional xenon modules, LED front fog lamps, these larger 18 inch diamond cut alloy wheels and chrome for the door handles and the rear bumper. The Prestige package also includes headlamp washers, part leather upholstery, sports style front seats with adjustable lumbar support, a keyless entry and start system and interior mood lighting. Plus, the infotainment screen features a reversing camera. In addition, you get extra practicality with a ski hatch for longer items, a rear armrest and rear seat back pockets. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Crossback model's trim is based on prestige spec but embellished with a package of extra features. A standard gloss black pack sees that finish applied to the door mirrors, the rear spoiler and the front bumper inserts and you'll also find it on the 18 inch wheels. There are also aluminium roof bars, black wheel arch protectors, uh, aluminium door sill protectors and premium carpet mats. On to options, we'd really want to try to stretch to one of the extra cost leather packs that really complete the interior of this car, all supplied with front seat heating and a massage function. You can get the usual full leather trimming, but uh, it really is worth finding a little extra to get the lovely so-called watch strap leather package for the seat facings, embossed with the DS branding and featuring a distinctively quilted, super soft, semi-aniline finish that all your passengers will notice. And while you're spoiling yourself, you might also want to tick the box for the thumping Denon Hi-Fi system with its digital amplifier, four woofers, four tweeters, and a boot-mounted subwoofer. Otherwise, the other main options are really aesthetic ones. The contrast packs give you the option of specifying the roof in a contrasting colour. Black, if you want to be discreet or if your preference is to be slightly more overt. Orange, purple or vibrant virtual blue. There's metallic or pearlescent paint, of course, the option of chrome door mirror covers, and the wheels can be finished in gloss black, which is hideously difficult to keep looking pristine, or specify with a larger 19-inch rim size. We'd also be tempted by the Faubourg pack that includes monogram DS graphics for the roof and the door mirrors. More practically, your dealer can add in the usual carriers for bicycles, skis, snowboards and roof boxes. And there are useful touches too, like a universal phone holder that you can mount on the windscreen. Safety-wise, well, the age of this design is illustrated by the lack of the kind of electronic assistance features that you find with many rivals. Things like autonomous braking systems, uh, driver fatigue detection features, or lane departure warning setups. You can, though, pay extra for a blind spot monitoring system that, on the move, warns you if you're about to dangerously pull out to overtake. It comes packaged up with front parking sensors. 
More familiar safety elements provided as standard include twin front, side and curtain airbags, plus the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction and stability to hopefully ensure that you never have to use them. You also get uh, twin rear ice fix child seat fastening points and hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Engine-wise, much has changed with this car since its original introduction back in 2011. Then the range was built around previous generation PSA group units, um, EHDI diesels and old tech VTI petrol power plants. But even before this design switch to DS branding, these have been largely phased out. What we have now instead is a far more frugal portfolio of options, primarily an entry-level three-cylinder PureTech 1.2-litre turbo petrol unit and a range of 1.6-litre Blue HDI diesels. For this redeveloped car, the engineers have also upgraded the performance-minded end of the range. Models using the older BMW-developed 1.6-litre THP petrol turbo engine. With these, the tweaks have not just increased power, but also enhanced efficiency. As you might expect, in this day and age, all the power plants on offer are turbocharged, feature eco-engine stop and start systems, and meet Euro emissions regulations. The result, at least in the case of the PureTech petrol and the Blue HDI diesel models, is a very class competitive set of running cost figures. Now I'm going to quote these assuming the use of 17-inch wheels. Bear in mind that 18-inch rims, like the ones we're using here, will hit the returns by about 5%. Anyway, let's start with the least expensive PureTech 130 petrol model which returns 55.4 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 119 grams per kilometre of CO2. Figures that, until a few years ago, would have been considered perfectly acceptable for a diesel model and a showing that gets very close to that of the class leaders like Audi's directly comparable A3 Sportback 1.2 TFSI. The DS engineers also seem to have targeted Audi with their blue HDI diesel engines. The combined cycle 74.3 miles per gallon fuel figure of the 120 brake horsepower variant I'm trying here is identical to that of an A3 1.6 TDI. But while the Ingolstadt model uh, dips just beneath the important 100 grams per kilometre tax threshold, the 120 brake horsepower and 150 brake horsepower Blue HDI DS4 variants record 100 grams per kilometre exactly. What else might you need to know? Well, there's a fractional fuel consumption penalty for choosing the E86 automatic gearbox on this Blue HDI 120 model, or for going for the Pokia 150 brake horsepower power plant, which only comes with manual transmission. It's not very significant, though. Your returns will take a bit more of a drop, though, if you choose the top auto-only Blue HDI 180 variant, which manages 64.2 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 115 grams per kilometre of CO2. Overall, though, we're talking of a set of efficiency stats that, uh, for mainstream models, are right on the pace in this segment, in a way that wasn't the case for this car for most of its life as a Citroen. So, how has this been achieved? Well, with Blue HDI diesel technology, the answer lies in a clever three-step after-treatment system designed to better eliminate the four nasty pollutants that diesel units usually put out, namely unburned hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides and particulates. The first stage sees the unwanted hydrocarbon and carbon monoxide elements uh, converted into harmless water and carbon dioxide. In the second stage, that nasty nitrogen oxide also gets converted into water via a selective catalytic reduction process using a urea and water mixture called AdBlue, although you will need to get that mixture topped up every 12,500 miles. Finally, in the third step, a particulate emissions filter eliminates virtually all particulates at a stroke. And the result of all this is industry-leading diesel technology that many manufacturers are struggling to copy. Equal effort has been put into the PureTech technology used in the base three-cylinder 1.2-litre turbo petrol unit. It's around 25% cleaner and more frugal than the old 1.6-litre VTI power plant it replaced. These gains achieved by lighter weight, engine stop and start technology and a 30% reduction in mechanical losses due to friction. Internal friction has also been reduced further up the range with the Pokia 1.6 litre THP turbo petrol engines, which, as I suggested earlier, are a little more frugal than before. 
The returns here aren't quite as eye-catching if you compare against direct rivals, but they're a lot more competitive than those this engine used to produce. Specifically, we're talking 50.4 miles per gallon and 130 grams per kilometre for the THP165 model, and 47.9 miles per gallon and 138 grams per kilometre for the potent flagship THP210 performance variant. What else? Uh, well, to help owners get somewhere near the quoted returns on a regular basis, there's a gear shift indicator, plus you can benefit from a series of eco-driving tips provided by the DS Connect Box's monitoring pack. The trip computer in the instrument binnacle even has an eco readout that tells you how long the eco stop and start system has been functioning for on any given journey. Although, actually, we're not really sure why you'd ever want to know that. Residuals uh, inevitably won't be as strong as they would be with prestige branded German rivals. Expect between 37 to 40% of your initial purchase price back after the industry standard three year 60,000 mile ownership period. We think that showing will improve though as the DS brand gets more established in the market. The warranty is the usual unremarkable three year 60,000 mile affair. And service intervals vary depending on the engine you choose. With the Blue HDI diesels, they're rather frequent, every 12,500 miles. Uh, go for the petrol units though, and it's every year or 20,000 miles, whichever comes first. Finally, let's talk about insurance. For a base elegance model, you're looking at Group 17E with a PureTech 130 petrol engine, Group 20E with the Blue HDI 120 diesel, and Group 24E if you go for the Blue HDI 150 diesel. These ratings will all rise by two if you choose plusher prestige trim. If you want more performance, well, inevitably you'll pay your broker for it. Although the auto-only THP165 petrol model is reasonably rated at Group 22E, the Blue HDI 180 diesel and the THP210 petrol variants come in at Group 27E. Rather unfairly, the Crossback model attracts an insurance penalty over its standard range counterpart, which means that in the Crossback lineup, a PureTech 130 model is Group 21E, the Blue HDI 120 is Group 24E, and the Blue HDI 180 variant is Group 30E. You could see the thinking behind the original version of this car. It targeted family folk looking for something more interesting than a conventional Golf or Focus or Astra hatch. People who maybe liked the idea of a premium badge model of this kind, but couldn't quite stretch to one. And folk who in recent years had found themselves tempted by a whole range of different types of car. Plush family hatchbacks, uh, GTIs, four-seat sports coupes and SUV-like crossovers. In trying to meet their needs, what could be better, the early designers of this DS4 thought, than to offer up a model incorporating elements from all these categories? Uh, a crossbreed, if you will. Crossbreeding, as we all know, can be the gateway to the creation of powerful new genes. But it also brought us the Labradoodle. In the case of the original Citroen version of this DS4, the crossbreeding in question went a touch too far. Trying to target the growing crossover sector with this DS4 at a time when the same car was being promoted as a premium sporting hatch proved to be predictably difficult. Reinvented as a DS brand product though, this model is a much more credible proposition. The crossback variant has a more dedicated appeal for Qashqai class folk, while this standard version looks an intriguing choice if you were looking at contenders like BMW's 1 Series and Audi's A3, but want a lower price, more individuality and extra equipment. There's a price to pay for individuality, of course. Not everyone will like the coupe design that restricts rear passenger space and all-round visibility or the firm ride necessitated by the sporty demeanour that the DS people insist that this car should deliver. For our part, though, we rather like the way that this car refuses to play by the established class rules. DS models should be different, just as Flaminio Bertoni and Andre Lefebvre's 1955 original model was. All right, so the DS4 won't revolutionise the market in the way that that car did but it represents an important chapter in the development of a DS brand that refreshingly emphasises the kind of ingenuity that used to epitomise Gallic design. The letters stand for a different spirit, and this car has exactly that.